Granit, I think uh, we can start and whoever arrives later on, anyway, we are recording this um, training session. So it, um, uh, you, you can just uh, uh, watch it again. So a very warm welcome to all of you who, jo who joined us today. And um, my name is Aniko and I'm working with the European University Foundation and uh, we are a member of the European Digital Student Service Infrastructure EDSSI uh, project. And uh, this uh, training is being organized under the umbrella of this project. And let me introduce you here two of my dear colleagues uh, who are also working on this project with us from Jean, Alicia Florio and Christos Canalopoulos, and they are going to be your trainers uh, today. And um, uh, just two very uh, practical information. One is that uh, the meeting is being recorded and when you joined the meeting, you uh, consented that, to the fact that this is being uh, recorded. And uh, secondly, um, there is going to be a Menti link that we uh, suggest that you uh, will already open in the beginning of the of the uh, presentation as soon as you see the link and you keep that open on your phone or on your browser so whenever there is a, a polling question you can just uh, switch to the screen and answer the question and uh, uh, the the trainers Litia and Christos will always uh, let you know when you can and uh, welcome to ask uh, questions um, during uh, the the various topics of this um, of this training. And so, first of all, um, let me tell you very, very briefly a few words about this EDSSI project. Um, that is a self-funded project and um, aimed to basically continue and uh, further develop the already existing digitalization tools. Uh, what do I mean here? Digitalization tools uh, for the Erasmus Plus Mobility Management. You all know these, the Erasmus Without Paper Network, the My Academic ID, the dashboard, the OLA, uh, and etc. So all of these tools to, to maintain them and, uh, and further develop them. However, these were originally different projects and, and different uh, developments. Uh, made by different um, uh, partners, uh, we realized that it is really, really important that we link these silo projects and basically break down these uh, invisible walls between them, uh, not only from the policy and practical perspective, but also from the technical perspective. And our aim within the EDSSI project is to harmonize these various systems and their uh, uh, operation and to add the student service provider is a very important stakeholders of this entire ecosystem to the system, link them uh, also on a technical uh, 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 level. And uh, within this to provide a full mobility experience for students. And on my next slide, I'm just very briefly uh, would like to introduce you how the, the EDSSI project uh, has been built up like I said, it is basically continuing and further developing the already existing uh, tools and enhancing them uh, to be able to, to serve as a, as, a, uh, as a tool that is providing a seamless uh, mobility experience for students. And so the project uh, is around two main policy frameworks. One is the European Student uh, Card Initiative that I am sure that uh, many of you are very familiar with, and uh, the ADAS regulations. And uh, the entire project is contributing to the rollout of the Erasmus Plus digitalization roadmap. And the other building blocks are the Erasmus dashboard, that is basically the basis of all of those web services that we are developing in the EDSSI uh, project. The other one is the Erasmus Without Paper Network that is basically um, uh, provided the, the basics for the interoperability infrastructure that is being built under the EDSSI project. And the fourth and last one, and this is where I'm also already going to give the floor to my colleagues, is the My Academic ID project 
accompanied uh, with the EST and the edge gain. And this provided basically the authentication and identification component of the project. And under this activity is the IDP of last resort has been developed. And here on, I am just going to give the floor to Christos, uh, who is going to um, introduce you the, the next topics and, uh, and the entire content here. So Christos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Aniko. Oh, thank you, everyone. So um, uh, we're going to start um, to discuss a little bit about my academic ID because we did see also in your questions when we registered that there were some questions. What is the my academic ID at this whole? And then we're going to talk a little bit about the European identifier and 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 discuss a bit about that, and then go to the IDP of last resort as a natural continuum of these aspects, and then that will be the main focus of the training today. So uh, in order to discuss about the my academic ID and to give you an understanding of what it is, um, we need to understand the student mobility use cases, which probably you understand better than I understand, but, but, but um, um, uh, let me express basically um, how we have approached this. And basically, in order to enable uh, the digitalization of the Erasmus Plus program, we need to provide services to students through which they can perform many of the uh, processes that have been done uh, until now or, or still have been done now uh, on paper. So in order to access these services, these services need to be able to identify the users. And in addition to that, um, institutions that are sending students to other institutions need to be able to exchange information about the students between them. So it is very important that when the digital representation of the student access service or the records are being transmitted across institutions, I will have a very clear and consistent idea about the identity of the person. So um, what we want to enable is basically the cross-border identity management and transport of academic attributes to be able to facilitate this digitalization of the of Erasmus Plus. So let me show you a little bit how the situation was before my academic ID. This is the situation more or less a little bit longer than one year ago. Um, uh, the online agreement was a service that, that uh, many of your uh, students were already using. And the primary method through which the users, the students could log into that service to submit their OLAs was by authenticating using Google or having a local account. The information that may have been exchanged between the institutions and the dashboard did not include any identifying information about the users that could correlate with the students logging into the online learning agreement platform. Basically, the only way that matching could happen between the users to make sure that, that the, we are talking about the same user was based on the email address. That was the only common uh, information that we could use to correlate users together. So what we want to do, we want to do with my academic ID is, is, is first of all, understand the student mobility use cases, uh, agree on a common way on how to uniquely identify students across services and when they move from institution A to institution B and back to A. And after having this, then to design a solution and an architecture that could enable this capability, taking advantage of the rollout of national ideas that is happening all over the Europe and interoperability across member state, uh, states thanks to EIDAS, and to implement this authentication interface so that students could benefit from this and actually enable the, the digitalization process with one single identity for the students. So what we have done is we basically implemented the My Academic ID Identity Access Management Platform. This is a single sign-on solution that basically enables the various Erasmus Plus services to do what? To identify users, to authenticate users, where they can actually leverage it as a central point to manage the identity and the access management for all the services, not having to manage this aspect separately at its service that enables the mobility process. And also to leverage the academic attributes directly from institutions through the National Academic Federations and EDG, and also give the ability 
for the cases where students could not use their local accounts to leverage the national EIDs to be able to send it and access resources. In addition to that, my academic ID had to be backwards compatible with the previous system. There was already a large number of students in mobility managing OLAs using Google logins. So Google as an authentication option had to remain even if it was at least to retain backwards compatibility. And of course, that's because we wanted to be able to support also more login methods. And this will become important in the next slides that I will explain. So the My Academic Adaption basically provides exactly this capability, one central point for all services to manage the users, and the users will be able to leverage the institutional accounts and the national IDs that they have available in addition to Google and have this single experience for, for accessing the Erasmus Plus services. So um, my academic ID uh, was launched last year. It's actually this, this month, uh, these days, it tends to one years old. Uh, it is a platform as a service uh, operated by Zeant. Um, and uh, for those who don't know Zeant, Zeant is a, an association of uh, all the national research and education networks in Europe who are our members. And we do operate um, uh, this service for the benefit of the Rouse Plus program. And we leverage basically EduGain and through EduGain the national federations and the institutional logins to enable this capability for the students to log in with their local uh, credentials and accounts and access the Rouse Plus services. Within this one year, we have already 85,000 users using the, the service, uh, 85,000 students. And uh, you can imagine that um, uh, in the last uh, basically six to eight months, the growth of the service has been exponential. Uh, the number of registrations of new users trying to go to mobility has been increasing almost on a daily basis. And as we go out of this very difficult situation with the corona pandemic, we expect that these numbers will grow in much higher um, uh, numbers. So uh, this is uh, um, uh, um, the, a little bit some general description about my academic ID. And, um, oops, I think I jumped on uh, uh, many slides. So with this, I would like to hand this over to my colleague, Lizia, to uh, talk to you a little bit about the other very important component, which is the European Student Identifier, which is one of the key enablers for all this experience and this capability to be able to access the Erasmus services and to be able to transport records throughout this mobility process. So Lizia, um, do you want to share your screen perhaps and, and pick it up from, from there? Uh, yes, Christos, I think that's easier. Otherwise, I'll have to ask you to share the slides. And maybe this is also an opportunity for people to uh, think about if anything was unclear so far, so we can um, look at that later on. I repaste the, I reshared the uh, information for a Mentimeter. Okay. Yeah, Lichia, I see one hand raised. Uh, oh. Do we suggest that uh, those person uh, post the, the question on the Menti or can... If it's a quick uh, question, we can also take that now for now and if it's only one. Yeah. yeah. Allow you to talk, Dahlia. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Go ahead. So, so, so once again, Dalia, you, you have to unmute yourself. Then maybe let's pose the question in the, in the Menti. Okay, so we yeah. can proceed. Okay, excellent. So um, I'll um, I'll follow up on the on what Crystal started and uh, dive into the um, ESI and why that matters. So before getting into the ESI, let's do one step back. 
Uh, this was basically the situation that was familiar to many of you, um, and this was before the My Academic ID project was put in place. Uh, basically, there were a number of applications, and you could um, log in to this application, uh, most of them via Google, if I uh, recollect things correctly. But then there was one problem. How can the application match the student records exchanged by the uh, higher education institutions with then the student records that are kept out of band that are managed between the institution. This was one of the first questions that we were asking ourselves when we started working together as a team in my academic ID. Um, and then we thought with federated login, basically if users could use their institutional login, then at the moment of the authentication, we will get some information already released by the uh, home organization of the user. But then we thought if the student record has changed uh, through the um, AWP, could use the same identifier with user attributes released during the login process, then we will be able to really correlate the, the data, the student records, with the students at any point in time during this process. And for this, obviously, you see that there is a need of an identifier. And this identifier, we actually piggybacked on previous work done by other colleagues. And the name was already there in place. The European Student Identifier had already been used for other purposes. So we started, we thought, why don't we look at this identifier and um, repurpose that and enhance its form to make it fit for our needs right now? And that was really where it started. So the European identifier, uh, by now you probably understand why is this useful. The main problem that we see is that the, the, ex the exchange of student records and the authentication of the students are separate. They do not happen at the same point in time. So basically what happens as a student, you go there, you apply, and you want to go on Erasmus somewhere, then you get your application sorted out, then a few months later you start the process, then you stay in another country, in another university for a certain period of time, then you leave, and only at that point in time, all your grades are transferred by between the visited university and your home university. But still, all this have to be uh, traced in such a way that only my record are transferred back and not somebody else's record. Also, the other thing that for us was important was for this identifier to be protocol neutral. What, what, what does it mean? We use a technology today, but maybe in two years we may use a different technology and we didn't want to change the identifier because of that. So there was, as you can imagine, this process took many meetings and more meetings and emails and discussions because we had to get everybody basically on the same page. Uh, we, we, we were discussing with the colleagues from UF, we were discussing with the colleagues, that the, the wider colleagues in the Erasmus Plus community. Then we wanted to make sure that the university uh, could, could be able to support whatever we had in mind and that they could release this attribute <clears throat> together with the other set of information they would release. We wanted then talk with the Edugain community, etc. So there were many players involved. And what we wanted to do was also to define a process to determine which services can use the, 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 the European Student Identifier. At the moment, <clears throat> the services are pretty known, and you have seen them on, on the picture that Christo showed, uh, the picture that I showed before. But in the future, there may be more services that are part of the Erasmus Plus. We, we, we can imagine that will happen. But And will they all need this? the European student identifier, there are also privacy aspects that we wanted to take into account. So we defined also a governance, and there is a link here, you can find more, more information about that. Now, coming back, how does the European student identifier look like? Uh, what is it you will have to tell your IT department? Well, basically, they will understand what they need to do, but you, you need to tell them what are the ingredients that they have to put together. You can, have multi, you can use the same ingredients to bake different cakes at the end, 
And because I, I'm Italian, I went for the very basic ingredients, which are probably also very common to uh, Hungarians and other nationalities, I would think. Um, so something to identify, uh, so the, to, to start with, we, we looked at what is already there. We didn't want to burden the universities with different things, with new things. So we came to the conclusion that pretty much everywhere students use a number. They are associated with a number at the university. It's called matricula somewhere, it's called with other names, but they have a number. And in some cases, uh, this number is, in most of the cases, I should say, this number is managed uh, by the higher education institution. So we need a way, something to identify the higher, the high education institution. Um, and for this, we, we thought we, we, we should use SHACOM organization value. Why is that? Because most of the people in the Erasmus, uh, in the AWP network, were already using this for other purposes. So we were not going to add yet another uh, layer to that. And then we thought most of the students have this code, this number, therefore we should use that. So how does this bring everything together? We came with a format, and you don't have to worry very much about that. It's again a shark personal unique code format, but then these two ingredients are combined together to create the the, the format of the identifier, of the European student identifier. This is the case in which the student number is managed by either a faculty or by the um, university, which is most of the, which, which is what happens in most of the cases. And you can see an example of this, and they took coolfaculty.edu with a number. So this will be, for instance, say if this cool faculty would exist, in this university, this would be, for instance, my number. Different case, there are few cases where we came uh, to, to, to see, and for these cases, um, the, 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 the student number is managed centrally. For instance, one case is Croatia. We, are, we, we know about that, but there may be other or national or, uh, or regionally. So for this case, then, we don't need to know specifically the institution because the, the code is unique per country. So we need to, to know the country where the code is generated. And for this, we need the ISO country code. And this is an example, uh, which is, um, I took Croatia, as I said, as an example, because we know that there is, uh, uh, is something that is happening. So how can my institution support the DSI? Now you have got something. But um, we should start to have this campaign, release the SI uh, for student mobility purposes. So in the context of the EDSSI project, Jeant is working with EduGain community because we want to leverage what's already there. So we work with the National Research and Education Network, with the National Federation to ensure that they can support the institution to release all the required attributes, including the SI. On the other end, still in the context of EDSSI, there, there are many meetings organized with the digital officers, uh, first the Academic ID project, DGAC, the commission is very much engaged into this, EDSSI, like today event, and other events, so where we hope to convey the direct level of information and for everybody to, to know what to do. So there are different scenarios that we came across and. I cannot believe that there is a, a scenario that has not been foreseen, but, but if you have a scenario that doesn't fall into this, this is the moment to, to let us know. So the first scenario is that a student comes from an institution, from a university that um, has an identity provider connected to the National Federation, which is connected to EduGain. Um, so in this scenario, basically, the links are here, the institution, the IT department knows what attributes they have to release. And by looking at the format of the SI, the SI they are able to release, construct and release the SI. So how do you know? Do you need to know if you are part of an institution where uh, that is connected to Edugain? In most cases, you will know this already, but if you are curious, we thought, let's try a nice example. Go to the online learning agreement, which is familiar to many of you, try to log in there and see if you can log in 
uh, via the, um, your institutional credential. You can, can scroll, you can find your university, and you should be able, if everything goes according to this scenario, you should be able to just be sent back once you've found your university. You should be redirected to your familiar login page to type in your uh, username and password and authenticate there. So there are another, there is another scenario. The um, university um, cannot authenticate to services from Edugain, but they have uh, the infrastructure in place for users to for, for students to log in for different services that the university uh, has available. Um, and in this case, the um, it's basically we we would advise always contact your national federation operator and ask them if you can join the federation how can be done maybe you are there maybe not check with them first and then go back to scenario one then the scenario three there are cases where we know that the organization does not have the capability to uh, run the infrastructure to support this online access Again, we still would recommend you to contact your national federation operator just to be sure whether they can help you investigate whether there is an alternative solution. We do know that in some countries such solutions exist. Uh, so if they can help you, then you can go back to scenario one because there is a solution for you. And then this is the last, last scenario where your institution cannot provide the infrastructure and your um, federation operators cannot provide uh, a solution either. So we can still help you here. You are not on your own. At this point in time, that's where the student mobility um, IDP or last resort comes in. But for this to happen, there is some preparation that is required and this involves different parties. So this is what we call scenario four. Probably you've heard about this. What's this scenario four? So scenario four is really for institutions that cannot join their national federation for whatever reason, where there is no IDP or last resort. So basically they need some different help. So this scenario involves uh, national agency. Uh, we ask the national agency to gather the information about the higher ed education institutions and this national agency will have to liaise with DGEC, with the commission. DGEC then informs, uh, compiles this list, this white list, Christos will say more about the list, and talks to my academic ID um, um, service operator, the, the, the my academic ID identity and access management service operator. The operator then gets the, the list and does yet another check, contacts the National Identity Federation to verify that these institutions are really meant on this list. Sometimes we have, we have had some false positives where the Federation will say, oh, no, no, but they got confused. They are already here. It's everything in order. Uh, so, and now it's where the final white list, the clean white list is created. Um, then we send invitation to the higher education institutional representatives to register on my academic ID platform. And then this once, <clears throat> sorry, the representative uh, registers on the platform, they get assigned the role of managing this group basically. So at this point, the, the higher education institution representative can enroll students from that institution. And only those students so that will go on mobility, not all students for the institution, only the students that will go on mobility. And this is important to know for two reasons. First, because the students that go on mobility, on mobility are limited in number. And secondly, because this IDP, this solution is only meant to support this scenario and not other scenario that there could be there. In the enrollment process, uh, there, there, there are information that are required and typically, as you can imagine, is the name, the email, and the identifier <clears throat> within that institution. The students that uh, enroll receive an invitation to register on my academic ID platform, and then they can use either the national ID or 
uh, Google uh, for, for, for that purpose. And now I will uh, really hand the ball to Christos and Christos will really go through the details showing you how things work and how things are done. But before that, I would like just to stop quickly and check if there are some any questions that we may want to address at this point in time. So let's check also Mentimeter's questions. And Annika, are you checking the chat? I am checking the chat. On the chat, I haven't seen any uh, questions yet. So why during every meeting we have to list to, to listen, li listen to this long history of the system. Well, this is because actually we could do without this, uh, uh, but uh, um, Aniko sent a questionnaire and some people really wanted to understand what is this? Why, why do we have to use my academic ID, et cetera? Um, we will share the presentation, the recording and everything after the events, sure. Um, Christos, do we want to look at these questions for now or will we so, may want I propose, to address them? May I propose that we continue with the next slides because I will go into more detail in all of these things. And, and I think um, many of these questions may be addressed uh, there uh, in much more clarity. Um, so, so I propose to do, to do that. Okay, then I'll stop sharing and you can take over. Yes, let me continue. And um, here we are and uh, go to presentation mode. And yes, um, uh, I want to reiterate also that um, uh, we do understand that not all uh, colleagues here are at the same level of, of, of uh, exposure to all of these things and to, to understanding. So sometimes we have to go also and explain things again just to make sure that everybody is on the same page but but this is why we try to rush uh, upon the the, the the introductory aspect but this is the the, the core aspect of, of the idea of life resort and, and how it works so um as it said um my academic ID leverages on net gain to retrieve the university identifier the affiliation and the user information from the institutions and even though a large percentage of institutions are available in EDGAIN, the National Academic Federations. Not all of them are there and have the ability to use to federated access. This is why we have this scenario three and scenario four. And um, I would like to say that already for the scenario three where BZC in Italy, France, Poland, and Spain, we do see their uh, solutions that are being provided by the National Research and Education Network to the institutions of those countries that do not have the capability to run their own um, uh, solutions. So they can go to the National Research and Education Network and use the national IDP of last resort provided by these countries. Uh, the reason that we mention this is because this is very important in the next months or years, we expect also more countries to be able to deploy such solutions. So the IDP of last resort that, that um, is operated centrally by Zian, is really meant to be the IDP of last resort, meaning that we have uh, exhausted all of the other scenarios and we need to support something centrally because there is no other solution. So uh, the idea of last resort uh, builds on top of my academic ID and it provides a solution for those institutions to manage the affiliation and the university identifier of their students that participate in the Erasmus Plus program. It is available to the institutions that are included in the Erasmus Charter Holder whitelist. And uh, I'm sure that all of you are by now familiar with this whitelist. It is managed by DGR. And there are two basic criteria for institution to be on this night list. One, that do not have ability to operate their own IT infrastructure for federated education. And B, there is no other solution provided to them in their country by the National Research and Education Network. So these are the two baselines that, that at least have to be met in order to uh, at least be part of, 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 the, of the white list. Christo, sorry for interrupting you. Somebody is asking if you can speak a little bit slower. Yes, uh, I can. <laughs> sorry for this. This is my, my, my Greek way of speaking, and I, I know that I do speak fast um, uh, most of the times. Um, so what is the process for the whitelist? 
uh, you, the most of you who are the international relation officers of your institutions, you need to contact your IT departments first and ensure that indeed your institution meets this basic criteria that I mentioned in the previous slide. If this is the case, then make sure that the information of your institution on the ORS system is up to date. This is very important and, and critical because this is for us the source of information of how we can contact you when you are in the whitelist and invite you to, to join the platform. Um, then uh, um, if this is in place and the you as the national agency officer need to contact the digital officer at your national agency and request that your institution is added to the white list of your country. What will happen is that the digital officers will accumulate the requests for uh, all the relevant institutions in the country and then pass this information to uh, DGAC, which uh, is managing this process and needs to be informed about this new request. The idea is that two times per year, in quarter one and quarter three, basically matching the two semester periods, the whitelist is compiled by the DIAC and is sent to ZIAC, the microdemic ID operator, in order to process it. And what we do there, uh, as Richa mentioned, is we validate the correctness of the data first with the NRIs to make sure that, for example, there is no institution there that should not have been, uh, uh, for example, because of a mistake. And we did have cases like that um, uh, uh, in the last few months, but also we correlate the data with the information we have in the EWP network. We should make sure that the data we have about this institution do match any data that already exists in the network. Upon positive validation of all the data, what happens is that um, uh, we, as the operator of the service, we do what we call the onboarding of the institutions of the, on the IDP of last resort and initiate the invitation process. You will see this in more detail in, in a few slides. So, as you mentioned, um, uh, institutions may apply to be part of the whitelist. But in the end, it might be the case that um, uh, they are excluded from the whitelist. And here, I would like to be very, very uh, clear and explain what, what those reasons might, might be. Um, uh, one reason, and, and I'm saying this because this has happened, is that the institution is not an Erasmus charter holder anymore. So from the time that, that they request to join the whitelist until uh, uh, it reached to us, basically, they for whatever reason, they are not anymore Erasmus Charter holder, so there is no point to be added in the whitelist in the first place. Um, the other possibility, and this is perhaps one of the most common cases, is that there is missing information about the institution that prevents the boarding to happen. And usually, the information that is missing is the contact information. We have many, many, many cases where contact information is missing. And that's, we cannot, we cannot continue with the onboarding process. So we have, we have to, to remove them from the, from the list in order to process uh, the rest of the institutions. The other cases is that either there is a solution already provided to them by the NRNs. So um, there is no point to onboard them on this central solution um, as if solution is provided to them uh, at the national level. And, or, they, that institution is flagged to us by the NRN as being in the process of setting up their own um, technical infrastructure, or they have the ability to do so. And that's, again, it doesn't make sense to use resources from the central solution, from the central uh, uh, IDP of last resort that may have been used for really for those institutions that do lack these abilities and do really need this kind of support. In order to be very transparent, we maintain two copies, two, two wiki pages that are being updated um, um, uh, whenever changes happen to the system. One is a public copy of the whitelist, including all the institutions that have been onboarded on the IDP flash resort. You can um, go and look this is this is a public wiki page and see which institutions today are part of this, of this whitelist. In addition to this, we maintain an, another uh, copy of the institutions that have been removed from the whitelist. And here you can see 
two screenshots that you see in, in the first one, you can go and uh, filter the uh, information from the whitelist per country. You can find your situation, see if it is there. And also check in the other page, the removed from the, um, from the whitelist page, where you can find information also about the reason why that institution was removed from, from, from the wireless. Both of these lists are, are automatically updated whenever we do uh, change our system. So, so they, they, they are up to date with, with the current latest information. So assuming the, the process has, has proceeded, we now have uh, the whitelist and uh, we can start the onboarding process. I would like to explain to you a little bit of what happens behind the scenes. And um, what we have, we're doing on our platform is basically we have modeled a system where we have created uh, groups that represent each country for which we have uh, institutions that we need to support um, on the IDP of last resort. And under each country, we create a structure where we have the institutions identified by the SACCOM organization code, which is basically the top level domain. And for each, in each institution, we have two groups of users. One group for the, that identifies the international administration officers and another group that identifies the students. Both groups have to register on the platform, both users. So IROs have to register on the microdemocratic platform by invitation. And you will see this in detail in a few moments how this, how this happens. And uh, in order to, to register, we have to log in. And the options for logging in on the platform are two today, and we will add a third one very soon, either with your national EID or with, your, with a Google account. The reason why you cannot use uh, a login at your national institution is exactly because your institution doesn't support this, and you are now on the IDP flash result exactly because of this problem. So for national IDs, the, uh, what is supported right now today through EIDAS is, is authentication in, through, in Belgium, Croatia, Czech Republic, Estonia, Germany, Italy, Latvia, Luxembourg, Portugal, Slovakia, and Spain. And more countries will be added, will be adding themselves in, in, the, in, in, in the next periods as uh, more than they move on for the production use of EIDAS. So, the availability of national IDs to citizens will be growing and growing in the next months and years. So we do expect many people to have this option, but right now it is limited to, um, to this. The other possibility of course is Google. And, and this, is, this has been there as, uh, as a, a backwards compatible support also for the previous system, as I mentioned before. And what we are looking right now with the support of, of, uh, of DGIAC and DD Digit is also to, sub, to add support for the EU login system in order to provide also yet another authentication method for those who can neither use national IDs or Google, then they will be able to use the easy login system to, to access the, uh, the platform. So students also have to apply for registration of the My Academic platform and register their student number. When a student applies on the platform, what happens is that the IROs that have registered for that institution, they will receive a notification for this application. They will have to validate the data in this, in, in this application, making sure that the, the, the details of the person, the name, the email address, and most importantly, the student number are correct, and then approve or reject. And you will see how, 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 this, how, how this happens uh, actually in, in a few moments. When a student is approved by the IRO, what happens is that the, the system automatically generates a university identifier for that student and adds it in the record of my academic ID. And as I mentioned, basically we use two ingredients. One is the SAC organization code of that institution, which we already know it is part of the registration process. And the student number that has been provided by the student and, and verified by the IRO, putting these two things together. In addition with the rest of the schema for the, for the SI, we have a means to generate an ESI for the student, record it. But most importantly, if in the future, 
that institution enables the capability to manage the ESI locally, they can just continue using these numbers because the schema is the same. We will use exactly the same ingredients like those that would be used by the institution itself. So let's look a little bit in more detail about how the IRO registration flow. And you will show some, some uh, screenshots exactly what you should expect as IROs to do in order to register and then uh, how to manage uh, student applications, etc. So when we initiate the invitation for an institution that is uh, part of the whitelist, based what will happen is that all the contact inf IRO information, uh, contact IRO um, details that we have in the whitelist, these people will receive an invitation coming from our system and asking them to go and register on the My Academic ID platform. Uh, the link that we can provide it can be shared also with the other IRO colleagues that we have. So even if it is only one person that is listed in our database that we get uh, by DGAC from the ORA system, this could be shared internally with your IRO colleagues so that all of them or those who need to be registered can register on the platform. When um, you will click the registration link, what you will see as an IRO is you will go to my academic ID and you will be asked to log in. Again, a clarification here, do not try to search for your institution because you cannot find it. You are using the IDP flash result exactly because as I said, your institution does not support federated access. So the options that we have today is either to use your national EID, through EIDAS, or to use Google uh, as an authentication option. And as I mentioned, EU login will be a third option that is coming soon. Upon successful login with your preferred method, what you will see is the registration form as an IRO to the platform. And the registration form is very simple. It has two um, uh, details, the name and, and, and the email. And in most of the cases, this will be pre-filled by the information we have received through the authentication process. Especially if you log in via Google, we will see your name and your email address there. If you log in through EIDAS, chances are that perhaps the email address will be missing in some cases of the name. Do fill them in and also make sure that the information is correct even if, if it comes from, from Google, just make sure that the right information is there. When you click Submit, on this uh, form, basically you will see this screen, a an email verification message. We have been sent to your mailbox, the mailbox that the mail that you use in the registration in order to verify the correctness of this, of this email address. This is something that we do for all the users of the Microdemic platform because being able to communicate with the users is, is, is crucial for, for all the steps of the process. So unless the verification email verification process is completed, you will not be able to access the platform as an IRO. After you have validated your uh, email address, um, you will receive another email from the system welcoming you as an IRO of your university. You will have yet some information about the SAC homogenization code that has been assigned to the university. And this is the information that we have from the whitelist. And in addition to this, and very important, you will get also a link that can be and should be shared with your students. This is the link that you need to make available to your students so that they can go and enroll at your uh, virtual institution that we are hosting on this IDP of last resort. Each institution gets its own link for the registration, so it is unique to each institution. So yours will be particular for your institution and you have to share this with your students. In addition to that, we provide also a link to um, uh, the wiki space where we can get uh, more information about how to manage uh, the application process. But I will go through this also in this slide to explain to you how, how the whole flow um, happens. So at this point, you are already registered as an IRO. So let's see now what the students will be doing. So you have received the uh, uh, link that you need to share with your students. And let's say that you have already shared it with some students. So the student clicks on the registration 
uh, uh, link. What they will see is they will see exactly the same thing that you saw when you try to access the platform. They will uh, have to they go to my academic ID, they have to log in. Again, the same thing applies. The students should not try to search for their institution. It will not be there because it is, doesn't support federal access. They also have to use either a national ID if that is available to them, or Google as a method for communication on, uh, for these particular users. And as I mentioned, easy login will be coming uh, soon as, as a third option to this. Upon successful authentication, again, the student will have to verify their email address. This is, again, I highlight this because unless this is completed, the record of the system is not closed. So the, the application is still considered as open. When the student verifies their email address by clicking the link in the email they have received, they will receive a notification from the system saying that, that uh, your, the request has been received and that the international resource officer of the, um, of the institution will review and approve or reject and the student will be notified about the result of that. So this is what, 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 what the students are doing and, and upon successful uh, approval, upon approval of the, from the IRO, they will then receive another notification that will inform them that they have been accepted on the platform and that they have been assigned an European identifier that is valid for one year, this is important. But if they need to use it for more than a year, they will get a notification from the system one month before the expiration and they can just by clicking a link and uh, uh, hitting the uh, request button, they can automatically request and renew it for yet another year. Um, so the default validity is one year, basically trying to cover the use cases of somebody going to mobility because this is really the, 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 the most common scenario. Now, what happens from the, um, uh, from the IRO side. So the student has made an application and now the IROs need to process that. So whenever a student um, uh, submits an application and completes the whole process, meaning they have also verified their email address, the IROs registered for that institution, they will receive a notification saying that the student with name including in the email and the email address X from institution with SAC code X has applied uh, to be a member or to be a student for, the, for your virtual institution. And in that email, there is a link included that where IROs can click, go to this link and approve or reject the application. So if you as an IRO click on this link, what will happen is basically you will again go to my academic ID service to authenticate if you have not done this in the last 20 minutes, which I think it's the single sign on session um, uh, timeout. And if you do this from the same computer that you have done your original registration, you will see already your preferred uh, authentication sort pre-selected. If it is another computer or you do it from another device that what you need to use, you will see exactly the same screen as you saw during registration asking you to select your authentication method. You log in as, as previously and upon successful um, uh, login, you will see this screen. And this is basically the, the, the application form for that particular student where you will be able to see their name, the email address and the student number they have supplied through the registration process. Until you approve them, the student is not member of that institution yet, does not have any SI. So your, the responsibility of the IRO is to validate that that information is correct. It matches what they have on record for that, for that student. And then hit the approve uh, green button to approve the application. And that's that. Uh, upon doing that, the student will receive the email you saw a couple of minutes ago, notifying them that um, uh, they have been approved for the institution. And from that point onwards, the student can go and access the Rounds Plus services, and they will be able to release also all the information, the name, their email address, but also the ESI and affiliation for that institution to the Rounds Plus services that needed to facilitate the whole process. 
in case some of the information is not correct, for example, the student during the registration process mistyped the student number, the IRO has the ability to reject the application. And when you click the reject button, uh, a small pop-up appears where you can write a short text uh, that will be sent to the student explaining why it was rejected. Um, and uh, the student then can also go and, and reapply and create a new application with the correct data and proceed with the process. So this is really the flow. This is all that it is. Um, there is nothing more than that. Um, I want to say a few words about the-, the Yes. Sorry for um, uh, interrupting you, but there are lots of questions. Uh, everywhere, so um, maybe people don't want to wait really until the end, and some of them are really specifically for this part, so maybe we can that... address some of them. I saw that Ivana has got her hand up for a while, so maybe she can... Uh... Ivana, I, I um, uh, allowed you to talk, so let's try. Okay, while Ivana <laughs> manages to unmute herself, um, there was a, a question here, where can me as an IRO officer see the students ESI on my academic, uh, my academic ID account? I see the name of the approved students, but not their ESI. So um, uh, this, is, this is a good question. Uh, there is a, a view where you can see all this information uh, on the platform. Uh, I didn't include this link here, but this is possible and, and that includes all the information. Perhaps this is something that I, um, we should add in the documentation to see how you can go there and see all your uh, registered students. Uh, that's not something that I have right now as, as a link to show you, but we can add it in the documentation and, and explain how this uh, how you could do this. Um, um, this is a very interesting question because this is one of the uh, questions that we have never received before uh, in our help desk. So this, this is interesting. And we'll take a note of that to see how to do that. Uh, let me see also from what we have tried is, is not to bombard you with a lot of information because for some it may be a bit challenging to, to process all this information, but these capabilities do exist and we will add a section for those who want to have more advanced access to the system so they can be able to, to do so. Uh, yes, okay, and there was also, let me go here, just another question. Do we receive the emails on our Google account as I roll? You receive it in the email. In the email, you have used to register. And I have, I have uh, in the next section, in two slides from now, I have tried to compile the most commonly um, asked questions that we receive in our help desk. And this is one of the things that I will address there: how you can make sure that you have the right address in your profile. But it is the email address you have used during registration. Yeah, and th there is uh, also, again, I think Crystal said that the made the student use the text box to select this institution if um, uh, her education institution using IDP or last resort. I think you did say that, but maybe you, you did mention that in the slides, but so, sorry, I didn't, I, that. I, I didn't understand the question, Lisa. Can you repeat it? So may the student use the text box to select his institution when using the IDP no. or last resort? Uh, let, let me let me say this again because this is this is very important. It's one of the questions that that we have been asked many times. <clears throat> no, uh, uh, if you use a textbook, you will not find your institution there because um, you are in the IDP plus resource because exactly your institution doesn't support federated access, so it is not searchable. It's not findable. The only options for the for the users who are on the IDP plus resort meaning the institution doesn't support federated logins, is to use today either the national IDs through ADAS or Google. And very soon we have another third option, uh, if you login. If your institution um, uh, does uh, um, enable support for federated logins in the future, this will be available in the textbooks, uh, yes. Yeah. And related to that, is this approval of students only done for the institutions that are not linked to the general system and are using option four. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yes, this is, this is, this is only, only for options. For, for the IDP plus resort. 
if you if you are, have a, a solution either managed uh, at your um, country by your NRN or your your institution has technical infrastructure in place to support federal logins, the students doesn't have to go through this process. All of these things you handle this at your side, and and the users can access the, the route services without going through this process. This is only for those institutions that have to be supported and have these capabilities from the IDP infrastructure. Uh, yes, um, I'm, I'm just checking if there are questions that you don't have in the slides that we may want. Uh, oh, and then there are um, <clears throat> um, uh, questions about I've not received the, the invitation. I, 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 I have, this is uh, yeah. this is a hot yeah. topic. I have it in my slides. Uh, yeah, exactly. You have that, so we'll take. Uh, and there is this: is this possible to change Google email to office email in the registration form? Yes, it is, and I will talk about this in a few moments. Okay. Uh, does somebody have the link to the white list? I don't know. I feel okay. We can uh, reach the the link to the white list was in the slides. We'll put that uh, in the chat again for yes. people to look at that. Um, and I think uh, just scrolling. Sorry, Christos, but I thought some people may want to understand some of these parts before we move into the other se section. On the HA whitelist onboarding schedule and status on the wiki for our university, you still see IRO registration missing, although in although in registered two days ago. Okay, yeah. We so, but maybe we should also say something about this. You have to understand that we cannot update this list at runtime. So it's not really media. At the moment, there is an update that this update is propagated and it showed up that if you this if something was changed two days ago, it's not. Uh... But 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 this is uh, <clears throat> uh, this is actually important because actually this list is updated uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so if if you registered a couple of days ago, this means that something was not completed correctly. If you can uh, send an, an email to our support uh, desk, that would be great uh, to see uh, what's the reason for that and confirm this. I mean, or, or if you can write which institution it is, I can make yeah, sure. Yeah, I have that, are... Christos. Uh, okay. It's BSP Berlin, but I will actually I will send a private message to Karina. Okay, Perfect. so we I'll, I'll follow up there. And uh, sorry, just. Uh, um, I think some some of the other questions you have there, but I, just yeah. to check. So, 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 Richie, I just, put... please, sorry. please. Sorry, no. Uh, so just to read out the the, the question of uh, Ivana. Uh, mm -hmm. So she wanted to ask: uh, once the invitation is received, the registration process is easy. But what do students do with the ESI? Some of my students are on their mobility now and nobody has asked them about the ESI so far. I think this is very, it's a very this good is, question. This is, this is a very good question. So, so today the ESI is, is, uh, is not mandatory to complete the online learning agreement process and to go to mobility, um, but it is required for certain functionalities. So for example, um, if they want to use the Erasmus Plus app and issue an and, 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 and Erasmus uh, um, uh, student card in the Erasmus Plus app, they will not be able to do it unless they have the ESI in place. What will be happening in the next months, more and more capabilities will be requiring the use of the ESI just because it is required. So for the basic access to the system today, the ESI is not mandatory, uh, but there will be more and more um, functionalities that will require the ESI. And if the student doesn't have it, they will not be able to, to complete it. So we are working on a system that evolves also as we go along. It is, it is not in its final stage. And, and we need to, we are preparing now for getting this final stage. Uh, where the assign will be really, really mandatory for the whole process is when also the exchange of student records is enabled. Because at that point, basically, we will not be able to do anything unless the student does have the assign to do this correlation. So um, 
Today, it is uh, the students is, it do not need, really need to know much about this side, but, but we are handling this for them so that they can have the, uh, this information. Um, the IDB Flash Resort today uh, acts also as another uh, very important mechanism. I did mention also the award affiliation, but I didn't highlight it much because through this process, at least right now, um, the systems, the landlink agreement, uh, uh, all the plus up also have a way to have a verified information that this person is indeed the student of that institution. Before that, we just were handling Google logins and we didn't know if they were really coming from students or from whom it was coming. Um, but the need for this AI will be coming in the uh, next month for more and more functionalities. And at some point I do expect that this will become mandatory for all type of access, but this, this is another discussion. And Christos, there is something. Um, can can we just provide students a URL to register themselves to our universities, and we just approve disapprove them as an arrow instead of registering and making them go through several extra steps? Um, they have to go through. I mean, somehow they will need. They have to provide the information about the student number and verify their email address. Unfortunately, because your institution doesn't support federal login, if your institution had the technical infrastructure to do this, we wouldn't be doing all these things, right? That would have been already taken care of, and and uh, and this is exactly the experience that most students have, where the institutions do have, do have this capability. In lack of this uh, uh, capability at the local institution, we need to uh, cater for that. So we need to have this in place. It is another way to, um, that this can be done. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think uh, we'll. Um... I think I've addressed most of them. There is more on Mentimeter, I, I'm aware, but maybe you want to go through some so of the other things and the, the I, FAQ. I have a few more slides and then some common questions. And then we do have also the, the Q&A session where, where we exactly. can discuss this in yeah. more detail. So just, but I, I just felt mean, that without clarifying some points, may, maybe people will find some of the next stuff not super clear. So that's all. Absolutely, and I think this is this is really good that we that we started the, the, this um, uh, this overview. Uh, at this point, I just want to give you some 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 overview of, of what what the situation right now with the IDB of last resort. So today we have uh, 378 institutions that have been onboarded on the platform coming from 21 countries. Um, and out of these 378 institutions, uh, I think around half of them have already registered their international offices and have started um, um, uh, basically uh, registering also students on the platform uh, for, for, to, to assign new site, et cetera. So the numbers are pretty pretty big and, and it is a, a huge endeavor. If you consider that we started this basically end of August and now we are uh, in November. So there is a huge uptake and, and actually there has been a lot of work and effort from, from many of you. And I would like to thank you very much for the support you're providing uh, to, your, to your users, but also for, for being part of this and making sure that this, this, this happens and is successful. In the next slides, I have compiled, as I mentioned, um, some of the most commonly asked questions that we receive in our help desk, and which we try to uh, to address um, as timely as possible, because uh, you can understand also that the load is, is huge with this amount of users. So the first the first question that we receive is a very simple question: Is my institution in the white list? And, and um, I hope that um, at least after today, you have also the link, you have also the link where you can go and check whether the institution is indeed in the whitelist. You can go to this link and you can see which institutions are in the whitelist right now, are configured on the IDB Fallacy Resort. This is the authoritative list if an institution is in or not. Oops, what happened? I don't know what happened, something crashed. You just uh, clicked on the link. Ah, okay, I clicked on the link. Uh, I think my computer gets slower and slower. Um, give me a second. So if you cannot find your institution in the whitelist, and it should have been there, um, uh, first of all, you should go and check the other uh, list that I mentioned, the list of the removed institutions. Um, if your institution is not uh, in the whitelist 
or if they remove list, then probably this means that it has not been processed yet. Uh, keep in mind that, that um, the whitelist will be processed twice per year. Um, we did one onboarding uh, at the end of summer, and we did another one a few days ago, and that was an extraordinary one. But from um, beginning of 2022, we will be doing this twice per year, once uh, at the beginning of the year, once after summer, matching, as I mentioned, the two semester periods. So another question is, is, my institution is in the white list, but I have not received an invitation. What's, what's happening? So uh, we do maintain also um, a status page regarding the onboarding. And you can visit this link to, to see this page. And there, what you can see is when the last invitation was sent for your institution and what was the status of this. And they are basically what is of interest, first of all, to find your institution that it has indeed been in the ones that have received invitation and this do map those that are in the white list. And of interest, is, it is the column that says last IRO invitation status. What this column means is if it has a value of delivered, this means that our system reports that the mail invitation was sent successfully. It was confirmed to have been received by your mail system. So this means on your side, please do check your spam and junk folder. I know it is obvious, but we did have many cases where indeed the invitation was there and it was not seen by, 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 the, by the IRO. And if it is not there, please do contact your IT support because it might be the case that your institution has some passive blocking of, of emails and uh, doesn't allow the email to come through. And please do ask them to make sure that my academic ID.org is not blocked, can actually send emails and these emails receive you and your students. The other possibility is that in that column, you will see invalid email address. What this means, this means that our system has reported that the email address used to send the invitation was rejected by your mail system. And in 90% of the cases, if not 100% of the cases, um, uh, what means is that probably the email address that we have in the whitelist is not correct. Do go and check the contact information for your institution in, on ORS. This is for us our source of truth. This is the information that BDAC gets, and then they share it on, on, to our system. And um, unless this information is correct, we will not be able to, to get the invitation to you. Um, if the information is correct, though, on ORS, and you know that you have, uh, we have the correct information at the moment when you applied for to, to be in the whitelist, then also do contact your IT support again because there might be cases we have not seen actually happening, but it can happen that you, your um, uh, institution has what we call active email filtering, meaning blocking the, the emails, not allowing them to go forward for whatever reason. So do talk to them and, and ask them to make sure that the emails from my academic editor are not blocked and so that they can reach you and your students. Going forward, uh, another common question is that, and request actually, is that, look, my, the contact information for my institution has changed. Please, can you resend the information for my invitation to this email address? The problem is that we face here, and I won't be very open with you, is that we as that cannot update the contact information. This is something that only you can do on the ORS system. And uh, then this information will flow to us through the DR. So the steps is make sure that you update the contact information on ORS, and then do notify your digital officer at your national agency and ask them then to notify the DIAC that the contact information has changed and that the data whitelist has to be updated in order to, um, to reflect this change. That process basically will lead us getting the update and being able to send your invitation, the invitation to you. Um, as I said, the, this, this, is, this list is, this is managed by the DIAC, so we don't have the ability to do changes ourselves there. So, um, Another question, and it was asked also um, uh, here, um, 
I have read from my, uh, my academic ID, but during the registration, I used the wrong email address or I don't email, remember what email address I used. These are both, both commonly uh, common points. Uh, in, the, uh, in our documentation page, we do have a section where we describe exactly the three steps that you need to take in order to update your email address. So if you visit this link, it will walk you through what you need to do actually is these two clicks to go and change your email address. You will have to verify the email address again if it is a new one. And then that will be the, email, the contact information we have for you personally on our system and the notifications will be going to that email address. So uh, changing your contact information on ORS doesn't mean that this information will automatically be propagated to our system. In the future, this might be the case, and, and we are working with DGAC to try to see how we can make this happen. But right now, it requires you to notify, um, uh, to basically either if you have already registered to go and change it yourself, or if you have not registered to, as I said before, to notify um, uh, your digital officer, to notify the DGAC, to notify us. Uh, another uh, uh, common, uh, question um, is that a student from my institution uh, has applied for any sign on the IDPO last resort, but I as an IRO have not received the notification to approve their application. What should I do? This means if you are in this situation and probably you know this because your student has sent you a message saying, what do I do now? Why you are not approving my, my request? This means that the student has not verified their email address yet. They have not completed the process. Until they complete the email verification, the system does not consider the application complete and the IROs will not receive the notification about the application. So please, in that case, ask the student to check their mailbox, including their spam and junk folder and make sure that they complete the verification process. When they do this, the IROs, all the IROs ready for that decision will receive the notification and will be able to approve um, uh, or, or reject uh, the application. Um, something that has happened also a few times with some institutions is, is actually uh, some more technical uh, 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 IROs. Uh, they went through the system and actually found the application themselves because this is available. And they did try to approve it manually without receiving the notification. And they receive an error if they try to do this again, because the application is still an open state. They cannot approve it unless the student verifies their email address. So please, again, in this case, ask the student to verify their email address to complete the step so that you can approve them on, on the system. Uh, and the last common thing that happens is, is um, we, we have uh, seen a few tickets saying, I have clicked on the registration link, both from students and from IROs, but I got an error. And what happens there is the following, because the medium through which we convey this link to you is via email, some mail clients have the tendency to wrap long lines. So the link that we send you for the registration is split it's in two lines by your client. And when you click the link, basically you just your browser opens only for a portion of the link, not for the whole link. In this case, if this happens to you, make sure that you copy the whole link in your browser and continue. So these are some, some uh, uh, things that we have seen, uh, four more things that have, we have been asked uh, 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 more than once at least, and we'd like to share with you. And with this, I think, um, I don't know if we want to do a break, short break and go to Q&A session, go direct to Q&A session, but, but um, um, uh, whatever you decide. Yeah, there are a few questions in uh, Mentimeter, so we can look at that, at those. <clears throat> uh, and uh, maybe we can start to answer to, to, to them. Let me, shall I share Mentimeter, Christos? Let me stop sharing, yes. I mean, also by all means, if somebody needs a, a specific, uh, um, <clears throat> has a, a really a burning question and would like to raise the hands and talk, uh, Aniko can, can allow for that. <clears throat> 
Okay, let me uh, share my Mentimeter. I don't see any hands raised so far, but uh, do not hesitate. I can add you as a panelist and you can unmute yourself and then uh, you can also ask your questions. Where am I here? That's where I am. There it is. Okay, so you should be able to see Mentimeter now, right? Maybe yes. I should stop scrolling, otherwise we cannot... Uh, See the questions. So, can the shock code of a higher education institution change? If yes, what happens with a given AWD? So, I don't know about AWD. So, so I, I, I can comment on this. Um, uh -huh. uh, it, of course, the shock code of institution may change. And, um, and this is a bit perhaps more more technical and, and detailed, but um, the specification for the European identifier does um, uh, expect that um, there might be multiple ESIs for a given student. So we do expect that in this case, the institution will be doing a, a rollover for a period, um, maintaining support for the old SAC um, code and for the new one until all users are, are basically moved to the new one. Um, uh, but this is this is an interesting discussion. Yeah. So um, uh, when you say what what happens with a given AWID, you probably mean a given a person identifier. Um, uh, that the, the the premise and what is required and is required in the specification that is that the ESI is stable for the whole duration of the mobility of the student at least. So the moment an ESI is is issued. Uh, uh, that should not be changing, cannot be changed for the whole mobility process. After the mobility finishes, a new ESI may, may be assigned to the student if that is required because of administrative reasons, etc. Yeah, I'm so there are lots of questions about what what's this, what's that. I added a glossary at the end of the slides, so um, and I, I will um, maybe Aniko can also check if I missed some terms. So we are not going to go into that. They were in the in the chat, and and there will be the glossary. <clears throat> maybe what do students need to top identify with regard to EDAS? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. I'm, I'm not <clears throat> sure. I, I'm not sure I understand so, you. But, but I suppose, I, I, what, how can a student use EADAS, basically? So this is, this is a good question. So, so basically, by using EADAS, they will be able to log into the system. That will prove their identity and actually with a high level of assurance. Um, uh, typically, what we receive, because they are a, a small portion of users, but we do expect that this will grow in the, in the next periods of using, using EIDAS already. Uh, usually, we receive um, just an identifier and the, and the uh, name of the person. So what they would have to do is then they would have to provide also the information um, about the email address that can be used for to contact. Now, um, it, in this case, if they choose to use EIDAS for the IDG of last resort, then they will be also assigned the ESI as I described before. It's like exactly the same, like, like logging in with, with Google. Yeah, and basically not all students will be able to use an EIDAS. They have to have an EID. So they have to be in a country where the EID is compliant with EIDAS. And the, in the slides that Chris has presented, that there was a list of countries still, for instance, in Italy. Italy has this system, it's called SPEED. I do not have a SPEED ID uh, because, yeah, be, well, partially because I live abroad, so I was, there was no urgency for me, but because I would have to go through a process to get this ID, which is different for each country. So, you know, eventually people will get there. So. Uh, it's um, it's very specific depending on the country you are in. In the Netherlands, there is another one uh, that uh, will be used. You need to follow procedures to apply for that. So uh, things are uh, very specific for each country there. Um, then which other questions, Christos, do you think we should so, really... So, so I see some that are, I mean, all of them are very interesting. Um, yeah. uh, I see, is the ESI project mandatory for case where students can yeah. connect 
or at least where the Google email address is used. Um, and the answer is that they will have to use the SI at some point in time. So at some point, uh, those users will, will not be able to continue using only their the, the Google email address. So please take this into account and either look into how your institution will be able to support federal login so they can issue the ESI or whether your institution needs to be supported by the IDB Flash Resort in order to prepare uh, things. Keep in mind that, that, that this, this is a process, right? And this is not something that can be done overnight. Also from your side, it, it requires some work. We do understand that. That's why we try to start now all this process so that we are ready when, when this is required. Um, Another question that I see the interesting um, um, uh, is I will take them as I see them actually. The authentication will always be Google for students. So the answer is, is no. And right now, there are two options nationally for the students of IDB for last resort. And the two options are national IDs and Google. And uh, version will also add uh, EU login also as another option. Um, what is, I will take them one by one, what is the Hey identifier? Um, I think let's say refresh that this is a SAC um, uh, home organization code of the institution, the top level domain. This is a way that we can identify easily your domain and distinguish it from another institution. Um, if a person studies bachelor, then, then master, then PhD, should the person's unique code be the same? This depends on the policies of your institution. Uh, right. The minimum requirement that uh, the ESI specification sets is that the ESI remains stable during the mobility process of a student. Now, uh, we already know that in many institutions and in many countries also talk about using the ESI as a more permanent identifier for the student. So there is no reason why the student technically should change the personal unique code. This is a business administrative decision of the institution. Yeah, but Chris, maybe one, one thing, what do we see though? Because the bachelor is done in an institution, the master is done elsewhere, the PhD is done elsewhere. At the moment, the most common scenario right now, which it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't say what it will be in a few years, is that those things change because they are different. If, but If different institutions are, 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 are used, yes. But yeah. again, if they are in the same country, the country has a national student code, it might be the same. So, so these this all things depend. Yeah. But the specification do cater for multiple ESIs per student. Who precisely can IT departments contact if the transfer, if the transfer of the ESI does not work? Um, this is a good question. First of all, we do have a, a <clears throat> test service where um, your um, IT people can use to test the attribute release. A suggestion is ask your IT department to get in touch with the National Identity Federation. They do have all this information and they can guide them through this process. Um, next question, some of the institutions in Turkey could not receive the invitation emails when it will be sent to the Turkish institutions. Please uh, do check the, the status page that I um, uh, pasted, that I showed in, in the link uh, in the, my presentation from before. See if they have received it or not. And if not, um, see the reason. So either it might be that the email address that we have on record is invalid, or it might be the case that um, the email is somehow being filtered out of the institution. Um, but please do, do go and check there and, 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 and you can see it in the status. Uh, Christos, um, Thomas has a question. I added him as a panelist, so you go ahead, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, it's not really a question. It's about uh, co maybe you can confirm something because it's really a lot of information for us and really a lot of new information we have to process. So I just wanted to clarify um, the main objective why we are doing this is to get like this ESI code in the end, right? And with this code, we can connect our students to the other tools of the EVP network, like the dashboard and uh, OLA and everything else. Is that correct? Just to correct. get it right. Correct. You, you get two things. One, the major thing is the ESI, and the second the other thing is, is the affiliation. So after the users, the students go through this process, we know that this person logging in with Google or EI does is a member, is a student of that institution. So this is information required by all the other components to be able to, uh, to provide services to the, to the 
And, and maybe the underlying motivation for all this is that there is this uh, is to support the digit digitalization of the whole process. So eventually, the student uh, will log in online to access everything. Eventually, the institution will transfer everything online. Everything will be online. And but to, for that to happen, you have to prepare all the ground for everything to be in place. And may I also add here, just from the dashboard and from the EWP connection point of view, so ESI is being used as the identifier of the student throughout the entire mobility journey. Uh, in the future, it's going to happen from the application. So if you perhaps followed the, the webinars with the Erasmus app, where you can already use uh, uh, ESI to generate an, an Erasmus student card, an, a European student card in the Erasmus app. So from there till the end of the procedure, till the student gets the transcript of record, this ESI will identify that this student is coming from this university to be able to connect to the dashboard. If you want to use dashboard as a tool for your mobility management, for that, you, of course, have to register on the dashboard and use the dashboard from the platform directly. So by registering for the ESI and the IDP of last resort, it will not register you automatically and provide you an account on the uh, Erasmus dashboard. Is that an answer, Thomas? Yeah, it helps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let me check also this. Uh, okay, we uh, I'll mark this as answered because there is the glossary. Turkey, we did uh, address that. This presentation did not make it clear. All, oh, okay. I well, may I may I react on this, uh, Lichia? Yeah. So what I am planning to do because. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I may, may, you are not aware of the fact that I was also an IRO just two years ago, I worked in Hungary, and then I arrived to the European University Foundation and I found myself in the middle of the EDSSI project, uh, everybody talking about uh, ESI, My Academic ID, uh, National Federations, NRENS, uh, ORS and I had no idea what is going on and uh, honestly it took me at least six months to figure out where am I and to be able to understand uh, what is going on. This is complex and I, it, 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 it indeed takes time until you uh, oversee the entire thing and I understand that as an IRO in many many cases you just do not have the time for this. To summarize uh, what we are going to do from the UF part after this, we are going to have the recording. So you can actually uh, watch again, you know, like uh, scroll back and, and make sure that you understand that the Christos and Clitia uh, presented to you, but we are also going to uh, provide you with uh, a type of a summary next to the slides. Uh, and we are going to also update our wiki page with some uh, guidelines that will help you out. So we hope that all together the visuals the, the recording and the supporting textual guidelines will really provide you with, uh, with information and short and concise uh, uh, guidelines that will help you with this. And in any case, in the end, you can always turn to us and ask uh, questions. I, I hope this, uh, this uh, will help. Yeah, but also I think when you see, I mean, if you read the manual, how to use something that you use every day, like your remote control, if you read the manual, it's complex and there are lots of things, but once you have used that, you do know, I mean, maybe you don't know all the details, but you know how to operate that. And this is what we are going, we, we hope, uh, once you start using the system, it's actually, you don't need to know all the details there and you don't have to look at that. It, it will be much more automatic for you to say, okay, this is the link, I get that, I click, I put the information, I press enter, I then go back here. So it, it's really a matter of using things. And we appreciate that all this looks very complex, but at the end, it, it is not so complex. I, I, I'm pretty sure about that. So. That I also second. So when you go to the <clears throat> site and you start clicking, it will so be brave, actually. 
uh, and yes. it will work. It, yeah. In fact, actually, it's good if people try because it, it really helps. Even, you know, simple things, if you read, the, if, even if you read, the, if you look at the manual for your car, I think you will say, oh, my God. But then you can still know how to, you know, you start clicking on the buttons and then you will figure out how things work. So it's not so bad. What will happen if we use option four, but later our institution joins the general network? Um, I so, think so, Jesus, you touched on that, but yes, maybe good yeah, to... um, basically your institution can continue using the, the ESIs that have been assigned. We have designed the, the ESIs so that they will be exactly the same as those that you will generate. So all the information can be transferred and continued by at your institution. And also equally, here, what's, what time frame are we speaking about? If, uh, if we join Edu again in summer 2022, do I still need to, add, to adopt uh, to join the IDP or last resort? This, de this depends, depends. On, 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 the, on your students and what they need to use uh, from the platform. If uh, they don't need, um, they are not going to mobility until then, and they will not be using the tools that require the ESI, then you can wait until then, I guess. Um, but we have seen so many cases where they have come to us and said, we are preparing our, our IDPs at the technical infrastructure on our side, but until then, we need to be on the IDP of last resort to facilitate our students, and, and this is something that is already happening. There is uh, one more question in the, in the chat. Hypothesis. Hypothes Okay, this word I won't uh, <laughs> pronounce today. Hypothetically, what happens when a student changes his higher education institution? Does he or she get a new ESI? Um, in countries where basically the, um, there is no nationwide ESI, yes. If the student moves to another country, definitely yes. Yeah. I'm looking at this. This we answered before instead of the registering students, if we can do something different. Which email address has to be used for registering to Edu Teams as IRO? The email to which I got the invitation email from Giant or the Google address? Whatever you prefer. Whatever is more convenient for you, that's the one you use. This is up to you. So some students that directly apply for an extension after we verify them, what is the extension good for and when is this need necessary? So the extension is, is because the assignment of the ESI is for one year, uh, the extension is there um, <clears throat> to basically um, say that they need it also for more than one year, just in case this is, this is there. Um, the students will receive the notification one month before uh, the ESI expires. So um, uh, probably if you have received this from some students already, it is some students who are going around and playing with, with the system, I guess, um, because they, they have not received any uh, notification to, uh, to extend their ESI yet. We have not closed one year. And Christo, something about the update of, of the whitelist that we mentioned it will be done twice per year and maybe some more clarification uh, on when. Yes, so, so the idea again is, is to match uh, the, the, um, the, sem the two semesters of the year and do this at the beginning of, of, of each semester. Uh, we are still working with, with DTAC to exactly finalize when this will be happening, what are the exact dates for this. Um, but it will be happening twice per year. I'm checking. Uh, let, me also say, let me say that I, I want to apologize about the abbreviations because the abbreviations I used, uh, I, I thought that this, this is the language that most of the uh, uh, international relations offices were using. To be honest, I, they are also not familiar to me. <laughs> I have also to understand what, what all this means, um, but I think that's a good point. We should provide this, this kind of glossary um, so that everybody understands um, and, um, uh, what, what, what the, these things are. Actually, I did that, Christos. It's already on the slides. So I'm, Aniko can double check if I forgot anything. <laughs> um, so my higher education institution is on the white list. And on the link we received, I see that the email has been sent on Monday. I checked. 
the spam and everything but no email what does it mean so so uh, there are two cases either we have the wrong email address for you or uh, the, the, uh, your organization, if you have used your institutional email, is filtering uh, those emails. One of the two possibilities um, has happened. So how, how do they get in touch with us then? So you, um, to check uh, for that? Um, they can always send an email to support at myacademicid.org. Um, uh, but we do have a problem in, for, from GDPR to reveal email addresses that we have from the um, um, uh, have from the record, especially if the request comes from another email address. Um, so this is this is a bit uh, uh, complex. But um, yeah, uh, in any case, do check what, what is the information that you have on the ORS. Chances are that this is the wrong information there. And also something that they did mention, perhaps I should mention it here. Um, uh, what we have seen happening quite a lot is that um, uh, the contact details that we have, that uh, we receive, basically people who are not in the institutions anymore. And we receive them in, in email coming back saying, I have not, I have started working at this institution since 2018. So, uh, so do the, these things do happen. And, and from our side, our system tells that the email was received, it was, it was sent and delivered, but it was delivered also to their own person because we have their own information. I think we have addressed all questions. There was one, but now I cannot see them. Licia, um, from, the, from the chat, uh, there are two more questions. Uh, one is what should we do to allow exchange students authenticate to our learning management system and other IT systems using my academic ID? This is a, a good question and this goes beyond of, of, of what we do right now. Um, so if you have <clears throat> an LMS system, uh, uh, do contact your IT system to make sure that it can support federated access. If it can support federal access, then it will be able to authenticate users and it will be able to receive also the ASI from the, uh, from the same universities. This is the work that Richard was talking about. Uh, right now, we are not connecting all the systems directly in my academic ID because my academic ID today is meant only for Erasmus Plus services, but you will be able to get exactly the same thing by using the federated login capability. Actually, I want to take another question here, which is the last one, because um, I mean, just to, to be sure that's really uh, that. How can the higher education institution mig migrate from last resort solution to EduROM when they enable it at their institution? I wonder if they really mean EduROM or EduGain. I would expect EduGain. I would not say EduROM. EduGain, yes. Yes. Pro prob probably this is, this is the case. Um, again, I try to, to touch upon it. Um, the information that we have on our system is the information that you should have on your system. It is the name of the person, the email of the person, and the, and the ESI that is generated from your student number. So you have already all this information. The moment that your institution enables the federated logins and you have your own identity management system, your students will be able to have exactly the same ESI and the same information that we have on my academic ID. And at that point, we can turn off the my academic ID site. And from that point, students, your students will be able to actually select their institution to log in and be identified by the system as being exactly the same student because their ESI will be the same. Yeah. So, Aniko, maybe there are more questions in the chat. Yes, uh, uh, one more or two more questions, basically. Where do I find the student's ESI in my, my, academic, my academic ID account as an IRO officer? So um, I, I think I tried to answer that. Um, you can, we can find this information uh, if they're a bit more involved. Uh, I didn't include it in the slides, but as I said, we will add in a documentation explanation 
of how you can get there. Um, a, a quick answer is that this information exists in all the application forms where we, to which you have access to, and you can go back and find and find all the information that has registered by the by the student. But we will provide clear information with steps what you can do on our documentation page. And so to, to continue on that, thank you very much. Um, is the ESI automatically transferred when the student initiates the OLA after the ESI was enabled? Um, not right now. Right now, no. Uh, they have, they have to, to log into the system so that the ESI is transferred. Which system? Uh, we have to, uh, to to the OLA. So so the ESI is is is, is managed on the Microdomain platform, and when they authenticate the online learning agreement, is being transferred there. Right now, today, there is no mechanism to automatically update the records, because also we don't know which records to update. Um, this is the purpose of the ESI to link everything together. So the moment they access the OLA service the first time the ESI will be made available to that service and be part of the record there too. Is it more clear now, Benhard? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there more questions on the chat that um, no? Okay. So just to get a bit of sense, because we realized uh, there was a lot of content. And as I said, when you see everything there, even simple instructions put there become a bit overwhelming. And this is not, super, I mean, it's not complex, but it's not super simple. And there was a lot of information. So um, we were hoping to, to be able to clarify some things, but this needs, uh, as Aniko said, it needs a further uh, review, re-listening, rechecking, trying out, and we are going to provide more. Uh, but uh, it's a bit for us to get a sense of, um, of yeah, wh wh where we stand with, with all this. Because at the end, uh, yes, you will have to do that and you will get help, but still, you will have to crack on that. Um, so I'm glad to see that, uh, well, some people had mind blowing, <laughs> sure, we, we can imagine it, it's, you know, two hours is a lot, but at least we are happy to see that, uh, uh, yes, I, but I do need to see, uh, so that's an yes, and we appreciate that you do need to review things, so that that's uh, at least uh, good to hear. So um, we uh, and just to 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 get to give us some help on things that we will need to focus. What aspects were least clear? Where where, where is that we we need to provide more information in, in which form we will see? But we need to understand what is for you at this point in time the most um, uh, challenging or. The, the least clear aspect, so we, we can we can work on that. And we'll give you some minutes to populate the text. We appreciate that there are multiple ro roles that we have discussed. There is what the students need to do. There is the IRO roles. There is the IT department role. So, um, Okay, so please just put down everything and we, I don't think we will have the time to review everything right now, but at least this helps us also to see what we need to focus, whether we want to have another session, whether we'll, we, we need to provide material online. Yeah, necessity of use. Just, uh, just to add here, so under the framework of the EDSSI project, we are going to co uh, continue providing trainings to you about these topics. Um, there's going to be training most probably in March and April, and you are more than welcome uh, to, to come to our final event in May, uh, on the 18th of May. Uh, it is going to be in Thessaloniki. 
uh, a very nice city during the spring time. So we will, we will send you invitations to all of these trainings since now we have your uh, email addresses. And I highly encourage you to visit, for example, the edsi.eu website, where, for example, we are going to uh, continue publishing all of the supporting materials for you. So, so for the future, I think this, this will help you. And um, so the bigger picture you were asking here that, that is in the middle of the screen and the timeline. So the basic timeline is the, the timeline of the Erasmus digitalization roadmap that you might have heard many, many times. And this is one of the repetitive information that you can hear at all of the webinars and trainings. And, uh, uh, and it seems like that, you know, like we still, um, it's, it's still okay if we explain that because many of the coordinators, the stuff is, uh, is changing uh, many, many times. So, so the timeline is basically now until 2025, right? So until um, all of the institutions are enrolled, everybody has the opportunity, for example, to launch an ESI um, or everybody is connected to the EWP network uh, not only students, but also staff can be authenticated to these tools and et cetera. So this is just really a very brief glance to the future. Um, but but this, is, uh, this, is, this is what is going but, to But happen. maybe, Aniko, yeah. we have to distinguish here two things. There is one bigger picture timeline that, that is managed by the DGAC. And they said something, right? And, uh, and actually, and we, we can be also truthful in saying that we were hoping to go faster with, with this. And we realized that, uh, that, there are, that, that there is some help that is needed and you know, we need to support uh, a, a lot of, that there is a lot of, let's say, difference of maturity level across institutions, across countries, et cetera. And we, we have, of, of, of course, support all that. But, there is also some work that is needed by at the application level, for instance, the OLA, um, the dashboard, et cetera. There is work that is happening. And with the new changes, more and more, the ESI will be used. Um, so all this is basically, eventually, the, the picture is that 2025, we hope, that the old process will be fully digital, Students will log in online, hopefully the majority via their own institution uh, managed solutions, whether it's the IDP, Edugain, whether it's something provided centrally by the country, but they will be more and more using their federated login, basically the same way as the students uh, checks emails and access other services at universities, they will use the same familiar login uh, process also for Erasmus Plus, everything will be transferred digitally, everything will be fully digital. This will happen. Now, it's a matter of time how quick everything can be put in place, how quick institution can uh, come along on this journey, but will happen and we have to be prepared. So my personal, and this is me speaking on my personal behalf, just to be clear, don't lie back and think, oh, well, you know, I, I need to, I, I just wait and do nothing because, because this is really not the case because even if things will not be mandatory, the, the new upgrades in the news, in the services that are there will be using the SI more and more. That's my... Thank you, Licia. I think it's, it's, it's indeed very, very important to, to, to see the whole picture here. Being cautious of the time, I think everybody is already uh, kind of tired. Uh, <laughs> we have like two more minutes, but I see that questions are still arriving here. So um, maybe we are just going to leave this menti open for you so everybody can finish their questions, right? Is that okay, Licia? Sure, absolutely. This and will the, remain open, and then we will uh, go through the questions. So we'll uh, put some of the, you know, we will populate also the F FAQ on the ADSSI website. With exactly, exactly. So we will make sure, 
yeah, we will make sure that all the questions uh, are answered. And so, Lucia, did you want to to post another question here, or or shall we conclude? Maybe Christos, if you have some last remark, anything. No, uh, I would like to thank everyone for the for the patience and, and for, for the feedback that they're providing, and this is very helpful. We do take a note that we need to come back also with a bigger picture. Our focus, Lucia and myself, is really on the identity side, but uh, we will bring this back um, to, to to the group to make sure that also uh, we have this more holistic uh, view that many of you do need also to, to be able to understand who, what where things are happening. Yeah, and maybe Aniko, maybe for us to think uh, for if we have a next training, we can have maybe some real life demo with asking people that are uh, using, for instance, the IDP of last resort, resort, uh, resort, how that works, how they do. So maybe that can help also other colleagues to see uh, how things work in real life. Um, Very good idea. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I see that many of you are already uh, leaving, um, and I think there are no more uh, comments uh, here. So, uh, like I said, we will leave open this part so you can uh, finish all of your questions here. And we thank you very, very much for all of your active contribution. And and these these questions really help us to see uh, where do we have to put the emphasis on the uh, on explaining uh, these uh, developments for you. And uh, just to, to to confirm that, for example, the ESI is uh, is going to become the unique identifier for all of the uh, students uh, that are taking part in Erasmus Mobility. This is why this is important that everybody can deploy this number for the students. Uh, so thank you very, very much for your attention. This is two o'clock. This is exactly what we planned uh, 120 minutes for this training. And we will come back to you with the, with the follow-up uh, summaries and uh, supporting materials. And please uh, keep tuned on the EDSSI.eu website so you will see the, the next trainings and the events that we are organizing in this uh, umbrella. Thank you very much and have a nice day and lunch for all of you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.